Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on functional move it, movements and circuits for one-on-one -on -one and small group training clients. Um, happy that you're all here and going to learn a little bit about uh, training our older clients. And glad to see some uh, familiar names on the list, some of our advanced uh, clients that have come through and visited our facility and others who I know have taken the certification or in the middle of taking the certification or have seen you at workshops. So good to have all of you. And if I haven't met you, then just want to introduce myself real quick. My name is Cody Sype. I'm the co-founder of the Functional Aging Institute and have uh, <clears throat> been working with older adults for a, a while now. I also have a kind of a real job, as I say, as, a, as a, a professor in a physical therapy program and I run our research program as well uh, here at Harding University and uh, focus on older adults. But today <clears throat> when we go through uh, this content, uh, we're, we're really just going to look at how to apply uh, some functional training circuits uh, for uh, clients, whether working on with them in a one-on-one -on -one type of environment or in a small group environment. And of course, for those of you who uh, know a lot about kind of what we promote uh, for businesses and, and for, for trainers out there, you know that we are a big proponents of small group training. And so we'll talk about that a little bit, how to do that, um, how, to, how to make it successful, and how circuits fit into that. And, and I'll explain really what I mean by circuits as well. I've been really surprised at the response of uh, my presentation on functional circuits that I've done at, at some of the major conferences. Uh, over the past few months, and uh, it's always been, uh, surprisingly, one of my most popular sessions, and I uh, get a lot of interest in it, and I think it's just probably because there's just a lot of interest in circuit training. You know, a lot of other uh, programs and branded programs have really uh, done a good job in, in promoting their uh, circuit training, and so I just want to make sure as we go through that you understand kind of what I talk about, what I mean when I talk about circuit training. Uh, if you haven't visited our website, which I'm sure you already have, I want to encourage you to go there uh, at functionalaginginstitute.com and, and check out the programs that we have to offer uh, for learning how to train clients. I know a lot of you are already going through our certifications. Uh, and if you haven't yet, you know, I'm going to cover some basic information so that you you know kind of where I'm coming from and, and you see our perspective, but really if you want to learn this stuff from the inside out, then I'm really going to recommend that you take our Functional Aging Specialist Certification. I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end. But let's just kind of jump in really quick with <clears throat> talking about some basics of, well, why functional circuits for aging clients? Why is it that we want to focus on the circuits? Well, we can look at it from a number of different uh, kind of perspectives. And I'm just going to focus on four very, very quickly. One is the opportunity. Uh, you know, there are a lot of mature adults out there. Uh, that's a humongous percentage of the population. It's growing every day. Uh, you've probably heard me tout the numbers of, you know, about 10,000 boomers turn 65 every day. It is a ginormous uh, cohort of clients and there's a huge opportunity for you to position yourself as an expert in functional aging and to really grow your business, grow your revenue and serve a lot of people really, really well. And that's certainly something that's that's very important for us is is you need to have a business that you are very proud of, you know, that you are delivering a product and a service that is that is making people's lives better. And, and that's why a lot of us are in the fitness industry to begin with, right? I mean, we want to improve people's lives. But at the same time, we want to make a good living out of this. And there's no reason why you, you can't make a good living, especially if you focus on this clientele, this rapidly growing aging clientele. There are just so many people who in, in the fitness industry who just are not attuned to this at all. And we're starting to see that mindset shift. You know, the paradigm is starting to shift because uh, the boomer population is demanding so much attention. But still in the industry, you can see it. You know, I talk to people about, you know, this opportunity and, and they'll agree with you and say, oh, yeah, but then they're going to go right back to doing their same old thing and work with the 20 and 30-year-olds. So a lot of opportunity for 
you to, to get in now and really establish yourself and help a lot of people. And I think functional circuits are a great way to tap into that market. And we'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that as we kind of go through. The second thing is really programming diversity. Um, and then another thing that we'll go into a little bit more detail about, but when you are working with this population, uh, and those of you that are, you understand the diversity that's here. I mean, it is the most diverse population or age group, I should say, of any other age group. I mean, we have people who, who are in their 60s and can barely walk across a room and can barely, you know, bend over to tie their shoes, hardly take care of themselves. And you have people in their 80s who are at an elite level. Uh, you know, I was, it, 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 just today I was looking at um, something that came through Facebook and, you know, an article uh, a video about a, a woman who's 77 years old and she's doing deadlifting and competing and you know it, we see that sort of individual um, unfortunately they're they are rarer than we would like them to be but but that shows that diversity you know that 77 year old woman could kick the butt of a lot of 60 year olds right and so there's everything in between so these functional circuits really help us to reach uh, a, a wider variety of individuals at different levels of function and health that you know when they come in it's also very efficient uh, our training sessions at um, our facility miracles fitness uh, we've been running that for about seven years now uh, we do probably about half of our our business if you want to call it that half of our business is small group training half of it is one-on-one -on -one, and whether we're doing one-on-one -on -one or small group training we're doing 30-minute sessions uh, it makes our training very efficient um, we still get everything that we want done, that we want to accomplish, because you can accomplish a lot in a short amount of time if you're eliminating a lot of unnecessary rest periods or if you are working on something, uh, an aspect of their function that's low intensity in between higher intensity types of movements. And so when we go through our circuits and some of the examples, I'll show you how we kind of mix that up where we'll, we'll vary between uh, certain uh, aspects of function that we're working on and on different intensity levels and et cetera so that we can get a lot in in a short amount of time and, and really keep it moving. It's very efficient, lots of energy. And that's where the group dynamic comes in. You know, it really creates a fun social atmosphere. It's very interactive. People are always laughing and smiling, and of course they're still sweating and grunting and groaning uh, as they exert themselves. But you know, the 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 group dynamic and the efficiency of the programming really makes the session fly by, and, and people really enjoy it. So, you know, that's really just a few reasons why we employ a lot of functional circuits, and and why I think they can be very successful if you work with with uh, older adults and want to really focus on that. So for those of you who haven't gone through our course yet, I'm just going to do a quick overview of our functional aging training model, our approach to training, so that you're on the same page as everybody else is when we're when we're looking at these the movements and the approach and the circuits uh, that we've put together. Uh, so for those of you who have gone through this already, this will just be a good refresher, a good review. Um, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll still learn some bits and pieces maybe that you haven't uh, heard before. Our model is really based on another model, and this is a pretty old model. It's called the Nagi Disablement Model. And it basically is a model that explains, okay, if we take somebody who's, who's disabled and we kind of backwards engineer uh, the process and say how did they get there and if we know kind of how they get there how does a person end up being disabled if we backwards engineer that we can figure out what to do to prevent that from occurring in the first place so we'll start just kind of on the left side of the model and that is it usually starts with either a disease of some sort chronic disease condition or it starts with inactivity, you know, a really, really poor lifestyle. Now, of course, those two things feed off each other, right? I mean, if you are inactive, you are more, more likely to develop arthritis or obesity or cardiovascular disease or diabetes or whatever. Okay, at the same time, if you have an active pathology, if you have a disease, that tends to make you less active, right? If you have arthritis and it's painful, then people tend to become uh, less active and so over time so this is uh, this is always over a long period of time 
and really enmeshed with the aging process itself. Okay? So with disease pathology or inactivity over a long period of time as we get older, that can then start to lead to impairments. So impairments are all the things in fitness that we really like to focus on. It's things like muscle strength or flexibility, range of motion, you know, it would be cardiovascular endurance. It's all the kind of the things in fitness that we like to measure, right? Well, as those impairments start to worsen, eventually they're going to start to impact our function, our ability to do tasks in life, you know, whether it's, you know, carrying groceries and climbing stairs, doing a work of some sort, playing tennis or playing golf, it's going to start to impact our function. And function, obviously, is really what we're all about. So we want to maintain high levels of function. Now, <clears throat> as function then starts to worsen, eventually somebody becomes so functionally limited then that they cannot fulfill their socially defined roles. And so that they are considered then disabled. You know, so if I am, uh, you know, kind of the, the breadwinner for the family and I'm the worker, if I can't fulfill that role, then I would be considered to be disabled. And uh, there's a lot of different types of, of disability. Uh, you know, it can be mental disability or emotional disability. We're really focused on physical disability here. So when we look at this process, then we want to focus on how do we maintain the highest level of function that we possibly can as we get older. Because even if we think about no disease or pathology, if we don't if we think about a person living a, an okay lifestyle, you know, they're they're appropriately active, well the aging process can be a bummer, you know, and it's, it can still catch up with us. And so, you know, we see things like, you know, muscle strength and power uh, going down and, and VO2 max going down, even for people that are active. Um, and so we've learned a lot from studies on masters athletes who are very, very active, right? And they're eating well and they're sleeping well. They're doing all the right things from a lifestyle perspective. They have very little disease pathology that's, that's present. But yet we see their performance still declining over the decades, right? The aging process is still there and still working. Okay. So when we think about that, um, then we just need to remember this, that we can't do everything to stop the aging process, obviously, okay? And that can lead to functional limitations. So when we look at the research, what's really interesting is that, you know, strength has gotten a lot of um, focus and muscle mass has gotten a lot of the focus of a lot of the aging research. And when we look into it, what we see is that really standard strength training is not the, the savior that we thought it was. It, it is not the um, uh, kind of the, the fountain of youth that we thought it was. It's very helpful. Yes, it is. Okay, but it doesn't solve our functional problems as we get older, okay, for everyone. And the reason, uh, in my opinion, is I kind of look at the, the, the research evidence and kind of as a whole, and, you know, in totality, uh, we see that there are a lot of different factors that are important for functioning. Okay, beyond just muscle strength. And so here's a list of just some of those factors that are very important in order to attain what we might consider max function, right, and, and then maintain that for a long period of time. So strength is certainly on the list, but we've got to look at what about muscle power. I'm a big proponent of muscle power. The research is very clear uh, in that muscle power is more important than muscle strength when it comes to function. Um, and then we look at all these other aspects of endurance and coordination. What about motor control? What about, what about somatic sensation? You know, on and on and on it goes. Right? So when we consider all these factors, then our approach has got to be that we're going to focus on a lot of these factors, if not all of them. Now, not everyone is going to have the same uh, need for these factors. For example, somebody might have a big deficit in muscle strength, and so they need to focus on that. Well, somebody else might not have such a need to focus on muscle strength because their strength is okay, right? So it, we'll look at, well, in our circuit program, how do we adapt the individual needs of the client to match up with all these, these functional factors that we're focused on? And we say this is complicated, right? It's, it's difficult to think about juggling all of these in a program 
and then also progressing all of them appropriately. But that's okay. It's okay that it's difficult, but because it's worth it. Uh, and we see that when you focus on this kind of panorama of functional factors and you really address them appropriately, then function really goes up. Okay. And so we've got this huge variability in function as people get older because people have a huge variability in their impairment level factors, right? What is their impairment? Well, again, it might be one or two things for somebody. It might be ten things for somebody else. What we see in kind of the aging process is we see kind of one, or, one of two paths occurring with individuals. Usually they might have one factor that is impaired to a significant degree, right? And if that one factor is impaired significantly, then function goes down significantly, right? That one factor being pretty much wiped out really has a drastic impact on function. You think about strength. Well, if you completely took away somebody's strength, well, yeah, obviously that's going to drastically impact their function, okay? But then what we also see, and this is what we see more commonly, that as people get older, a myriad of functional factors start to decline they all start to drop off. And this is the aging process, the biological aging process that's affecting these. And so usually we see people that have deficits in lots of things across the board, and there isn't necessarily one thing that stands out that says, okay, if I fix that, I'm good, right? So we need to, of course, then address this myriad of factors uh, for individuals. And again, depending on whether you're in a one-on-one -on -one environment or a small group or a large group environment will determine how you implement those uh, factors. And so for our types of programming uh, and for our focus, especially uh, for the Functional Aging Specialist certification, what we really focus on is kind of this frail, independent, and fit older adult. That's where we're going to get really a big bang for our buck when it comes to implementing uh, these functional aging programs. Um, the elite athlete is kind of, they're kind of their own little own little group, and there's some spe special things about them. And then also if someone's dependent and they're already disabled, then there's some, again, special uh, considerations that have to be made for them. So really the frail, independent, and fit individual is who we want to focus on. And that's okay because that's the majority of people. Honestly, the majority of this booming population is in the frail to fit category. So lots of opportunity there. So I usually tell people that, you know, our functional aging training model is, you know, it's where functional training meets the physiology of aging. And so I just want to cover really quickly um, our, the, our principles that we uh, employ in this model, and then we'll move on to really applying this for, for different situations. So here are seven key principles that uh, we built this model on. So ideally, we'd really like to be able to assess, prioritize, and then train all components of function. Now, again, depending on your situation, you might not be able to assess. If you're in a group environment or you're in a big gym environment, then you might not have the capability to, to employ these assessments. And so then there's a kind of another way that we need to address these components of function. You know, making purpose, purposeful decisions for every aspect of training, because we really want to make sure that we're hitting all those components of function uh, in a very effective and purposeful manner. We're going to integrate movement patterns to prepare for those functional demands, that's triplanar training then. We want to think about all planes of human motion, the sagittal, frontal, transverse combinations of those uh, for functional demands, really including isolation type exercise movements as supplementary to the routine rather than complementary. And you'll see that we, we use isolation type movements when they're necessary, uh, when they are purposeful, okay, in order to uh, assist with function for an individual. but the isolated type exercise movement program as a whole is not what we're looking to accomplish. And again, that's where a lot of the strength training studies have focused on is those isolation type um, uh, programs. We want to perform exercises in a seated position only when we need to. Uh, and it serves a very specific purpose, such as they're fatigued, uh, they might fall down, they can't stand up. You know, those are all purposeful um, uh, reasons for, for using seated exercise. Um, or there might be something about the exercise itself with nece which necessitates sitting down. But really, movement is life, you know. That's how we, 
maintain our functions by being mobile. Uh, order the session according to the energy level, so we do more complicated stuff, high energy stuff earlier in the program, and then later in the program we can do some of those more isolated type movements, or we can do the floor work um, closer to the end because you know we don't want to do an agility ladder type exercise at the end of their routine when they're already tired, obviously, because then there's a higher chance that they're going to fall or trip and, and hurt themselves and even get frustrated with the activity because they just don't have the mental focus to stay with it. And then maximize client safety and success by really looking at training holistically, and that is looking at the other 23 and a half hours of their life that they're not with you um, and giving them advice and, and making sure that you're doing what's, what's appropriate, uh, you know, all the other hours when you don't see them, but then also within the session itself, really being holistic about your approach. So those are really the seven key principles to our training model. So let's get into how do, how do we apply this in different situations. Well, <clears throat> I have what I call a, a GPS approach to applying the functional aging training model uh, depending upon uh, kind of your situation and, 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 and kind of where you are. So if you're doing large group classes and programming, then you really can't go through all these individual assessments. You can't really learn the individual needs of your clients. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to then just take a more generalized approach, and that is we look back at those functional domains that we, we've already talked about, you know, looking at power and velocity and motor control, coordination, etc. And within your programming, covering as many of those as possible. Now that doesn't mean you have to cover every single thing on every with every single session. Um, but that does mean that you know you need to have a broad mix of these integrated into your program so that we're not just, you know, have a, an 80% focus on strength, a 10% focus on, you know, motor control, and, and then a hodgepodge for the other 10%. You know, we really need to think, and again, it doesn't have to be equally. We don't have to think about, okay, 10% this and 10% this and 10% this, but we do not need to address those in a broad uh, kind of program strategy. And so I like to use it as a checklist. You know, really, when you write your exercise programs down, and you script them to then look at that and say, okay, what am I hitting? What am I hitting heavy? What am I hitting light? What am I not uh, getting much of at all? And now, of course, some exercise movements, because of the way they're designed, uh, the way they're set up is you hit multiple of those domains, right? But some are, you're going to hit more than others, you know? So if we we're going to say, we're going to do chair stands, right, out of a chair, well, that is primarily a strength exercise. Now, we could make it a power exercise by doing it really high velocity and explosively. So how you do it will, de will determine kind of what aspect you're really focusing on. Okay? But, you know, if you say, oh, well, that's motor control. It takes motor control and coordination to get out of a chair. Yeah, but really not much. I mean, that's really, really minor. That's not the purpose of the exercise. It's really not going to challenge motor control and coordination very much. So, you know, be realistic about it and look at, okay, what areas am I really hitting on and which areas am I missing? And that, that right there will just help you develop better programs uh, overall that, that are more functionally effective. Now, of course, in a small group environment, and so we'll, we'll talk about small group and what that means, but, but really I mean personal training with anywhere from three to six clients. Typically, our, our groups that we use are four to six. Uh, we like that sweet spot of four to six that works really, really well from a, a client interaction, uh, programming, you know, kind of standpoint and with the area that we have, et cetera. But in that type of environment, it really is still personal or personalized training. So in that case, you can do one of two things. Uh, de again, depending on, on your environment. So in our environment, when people come in for training and we're going to put them in a small group, we go through a full assessment battery with them. Right, we get to know them very intimately as far as what are their needs, what are their desires, what are their limitations when it comes to exercise. And so then the trainer who's leading that small group can focus on those individual needs for those four to six clients. Okay, so that way it still remains very personal and personalized. Okay, 
Now, if you're in a small group training environment in which you don't do all that intake and assessment, well, one, I would, I would suggest that you think about how to redesign your programming so that you can do those because that, that connection with that client increases tenfold when you go through that process, okay? And you're going to retain them longer uh, if, you, if you take the time to invest that uh, you know, time and energy into that client, uh, you'll get that back tenfold. But if you don't do that, then then what you do is you you kind of group these, the, you group people according to their kind of general functional level. So people don't have to be at the exact same functional level, but what you don't want is you don't want somebody who's down at the low end of frail, who's about to become dependent, and someone at the high end of fit, Right, those those don't work very well together in the same group, and we've learned that from from experience and uh, over time that it's it's best to have people that are at least similar in their functional uh, capabilities, uh, and so if you group them that way, you group them with you know some sort of characteristics, then without knowing their individual needs, you know just based on those characteristics that they need certain things more than other things, right? So as an example, you'll see in our low, low kind of function circuits, if people are at a low functional level, then there is a much higher focus on basic strength and mobility than there is with a higher function group, okay? There also might be a higher focus on basic balance skills and even static balance versus dynamic balance. So there's a, so just by knowing the characteristics of the group you're working with, you can at least prioritize the functional areas so that you are getting at their needs a little bit more specifically, even without knowing their individualized needs. So of course then, the kind of highest touch, highest level of training then would be specialized training. And so that is where you're working one-on-one -on -one with a client, you know their needs, or you're in a small group, but you've done all the assessment, you've done all the work to know what their individual needs are. And so then you can tailor everything according to what their needs are. And then you can progress them according to their own individual capabilities as they go through their training program, according to the effort they give and how well they respond to the training, etc. So you can really focus on their needs. Now, of course, that requires that you go through uh, a lot of functional assessment and, and really learn where their, where their deficits are and where their strengths are. And if you go through our, our functional aging special certification, you learn uh, some of those key assessments that you can use to, to figure that out. All right. So that's kind of the GPS approach. And so you see how the functional circuits are applied differently according to uh, the, 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 your kind of environment that you're working with, whether it's large group, small group, small group with all the individualized assessment, or one-on-one -on -one with individualized assessment. Okay, so you can kind of determine what your situation is and how you could apply this. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about small group personal training because I really want this to, to be defined. This can, can help your business immensely. If you are not focused on small group, you need to do it. We are, you know, working with a number of, of our coaching clients right now, kind of forcing them into making the, the leap into small group training, and they're all just reporting so uh, so much positive that's coming from that business-wise uh, from the training. And so I really want to encourage you, if you do not know uh, how to really employ small group personal training, uh, feel free to contact us for more information. Uh, come see us at, at one of the uh, conferences or workshops that we're doing. We'd happy to, happy, happy to talk to you about that uh, some more. And then, of course, you can always, there's, there's a number of people who are out there, I think, doing small group personal training really well uh, that you can learn from as well. But just kind of as an example, you know, one of our uh, clients, uh, who coaching clients who's out in California, um, she purchased a uh, kind of a circuit facility for women. It was a ladies-only circuit facility, kind of like a curves, but it wasn't a curves, um, and kind of came from another 
industry and other sector really didn't know a lot about how to set up a fitness business and was just and when we started talking about developing a small group training model she was just like no it's just not going to work you know my ladies are set in their ways and I can't do this and I can't do that and I don't have the space and so we really did kind of force her <laughs> into making the change and just say look trust us this is going to work it's going to work well and <clears throat> so we just got um, a Facebook message email from her uh, just the other day which said, hey, I just did my, my end of the month, um, looking at my revenue, I'd been averaging $5,000 a month, kind of doing this whole, you know, circuit thing. And now I'm, now I'm doing the small group personal training circuit that we recommended. And a revenue jumped from 5000 a month to 15000 So really big increase in revenue in her, and that's for her, and that's really nice. But you see that this, this small group personal training really, hits a kind of on a lot of different levels with the mature client um, and, and we'll talk about some of those here in just a minute but it's, it's not just large group exercise it really is personal training or personalized training uh, with a small group of clients that is can really help your bottom line and, and really help to deliver a great product and service uh, for your clients so why do it well there's a number of advantages for the, the kind of the three groups that are invested, okay? One, the facility, right? If, if you are an owner of a facility, then driving more revenue and, of course, driving profitable revenue is, is very important for you as an owner, right? So small group training really helps to drive a lot more revenue in a small amount of space. Your members stay longer, um, your trainers stay longer because it's, it's very enjoyable for them as we'll see um, and really a lot of opportunity there plus there is a different client that's out there we keep we keep saying this over and over again this mature client that doesn't go to these gyms or or, or goes to big box gyms gets turned off by them and turns around and walks out the door and, and we, we see this time and time again where people will come into our facility after just having joined another facility and gone in and said, you know, I wanted to commit to fitness. I thought I could do it. I just can't stand the environment. You know, I, I don't get any help. Um, I don't feel comfortable with those, you know, personal trainers, et cetera, et cetera. You probably see this, you know, duplicated as you look around in, in your area that you're living in. There really is an opportunity to, to tap into that different clientele. For the trainer, you know, it's great because the trainer is going to get paid more. Um, it, the, the workouts are much more efficient, you know, they're quick 30 minute workouts, they really have to be on their toes, um, and so they are much more engaged in uh, the training programs, I think, than, than even working with one-on-one -on -one client, because you can't let your guard down, you know, you can't look away, and I tell, I tell people, I admit this, people, that, you know, <clears throat> I've done personal training, I'm not a good personal trainer, I'm really not, because I get I get really bored to be honest. I cannot stand watching someone just you know say okay do twelve of these and I'm trying to watch them stay trying to stay engaged and watch their form and correct them and you know but I, I cannot stay engaged for a really long period of time. But when I'm working in a small group when I've got four to six clients. I've got to constantly switch from person to person, really stay on my toes, and it I I rip through a 30 minute training session and I'll rip through two or three or four and I will feel so much better because I've been engaged the time has flown by and I haven't been as bored so you know if that's you I'm sure some trainers you know identify with that um, but but that was me and, and so the small group really really helps me plus you know you can reach a lot more people with your expertise and that's why small group is so valuable because when you look at the client well it doesn't cost as much per session they still get you know that personalized instruction more than they do in a large group or, or on their own and for many of them you know it's just not intimidating for them to join a group because it's not as personal I don't know how many people I've talked to over the years that they don't want to do one-on-one -on -one training because that's like too intimate, it's too personal. 
uh, you know, it's kind of the people who want to sit in the back of the auditorium all the time or, you know, if they, they, they don't want to walk up front if they walk in late to something, you know, because everybody's looking at them. They, they want to kind of blend in. And so in that small group environment, you know, the tension isn't just on them, it's on the others as well. So they can slide into that much more readily and feel more comfortable in that environment. Then get still get all that one-on-one -on -one help that they need, plus that social interaction that comes from the group. So, you know, from the facility standpoint, from the trainer standpoint, from the client standpoint, it really is a winner. And when we think about this mature client, we also have to think about kind of the, the social and emotional aspects of small group personal training. I mean, I really do think there are so many distinct advantages to the small group environment for this population specifically. And I'm kind of a, a kind of a, a mature market junkie at this point. And that is, you know, I'm trying to find as much about this market that I can, how they think, you know, how they act, what their values are, what really drives their behavior, you know, what keeps them engaged in fitness, and they are kind of all over the place, but there are several things that really stand out, and that is that they really want to be in a place in which they feel comfortable, you know, they don't want that emotional risk to be there, uh, they want to develop confidence, and a lot of people have zero confidence in their ability to exercise, and so, you know, they join places and go in and work out and never develop that, that, that confidence, that self-efficacy that they feel like they, you know, can do it on their own. And, and I, I work out right now at a facility that is just kind of one of those facilities that's open for 24-hour access, and, and that's where I work out um, <clears throat> because our university, you know, rec center isn't anything great, so, so I work out in town. And I like to watch people, and I really like to watch the, the older clients that come in. And it's, it's difficult because they really don't know what they're doing. And we get so many clients in our faci facility at Miracles Fitness that are coming to work out for the very first time. They've never exercised before in their life, or they did something when they were younger, haven't picked it up in years. And so a lot of people in this age group are now really being drawn to fitness if it's the right kind of fitness for them. And and that self-confidence is really important to build. And we can do that in the small group environment very well. We really get to know these people, and so those relationships grow. Um, you know, if you're a one-on-one -on -one trainer or a group trainer, that's something that you try to do anyway, right? And you probably have a good rapport and you develop good relationships. But I really do think there's something even more powerful that occurs relationship-wise in a small group training type of environment. Uh, I think there's a, a closeness and a bond that occurs there um, that, that's pretty significant and, and pretty valuable. It's also a lot of fun and uh, while I don't track you know kind of member retention from an industry perspective, um, I've certainly I try to keep up on what's happening in the small group training realm in the industry and listening to some of the other uh, who I'll call them kind of gurus and business gurus in the industry, I think there's a general consensus that the small group personal training uh, is leading to higher satisfaction and retention numbers than what we see with either one-on-one -on -one or or large groups. So a lot of, lot of good benefits there. So when we think about kind of the small group environment, I like to kind of harken back to the Cheers show. And if some of you might remember Cheers, and uh, I watched Cheers when I was um, kind of in middle school. That was a great show for me to you kind of stay up late at night and watch. I loved it. And, you know, the, the little jingle about Cheers, you know, it was a bar. But the little jingle was, was, you know, where everybody knows your name. And they kind of sang that song. And I think about that from a group perspective. You know, that's, that's what people want. They want to be known. And so there's a power of this of, of kind of the group aspect in which people feel like they become accountable and responsible for something larger than themselves um, that, that doesn't necessarily occur during one-on-one -on -one training and may or may not happen during large group training because people can kind of slip through the cracks, come and go. They can be anonymous. You can't be anonymous in small group training. So when we think about that group idea, is really in our small group programs, we we cannot have just a collection of four to six individuals. We need to really develop that 
group mentality um, and that bond and that relationship and, and facilitate that in our kind of programming. So I just want to throw that out there because that's something that's very important for us um, and is really, I think, important for uh, I want to say, you know, mature clients as a whole, as I kind of look at the the data and, you know, read a lot of surveys about what they want and what they feel and what they value, is that this group idea is really, really important. So, of course, there are some challenges of small group personal training um, that, you know, I won't go into to a lot of detail about, but, you know, these, these are definitely challenges that you need to keep up with and that you need to be mindful of if you're starting a small group training program or if you're trying to you know really increase and magnify the success of your current small group training program you've got to deal with these barriers and these issues um, and make sure that each one of these are dressed appropriately if you want to be successful so let's go into now functional circuits and really look at how we want to apply these in these different types of environments. So I think there are some big keys to keeping these, these circuits successful. One is to keep the purpose functional. And that obviously is going to have a lot of different interpretations depending on where you're coming from. From, from my perspective, um, it is functional is really relative, right? It's relative to that group to those people that you're working with. And so I you know in the grand scheme of what's functional, I don't think of exercises as being either functional or not functional. I think about them along a continuum where for an individual in a situation some exercises are more functional than others. Um, I like to use the the example of, you know, a bicep curl. And I think most most of us would say, well, a bicep curl, that's not really that much that functional. Why would I just focus on a bicep curl? But yet for that older individual who really struggles in lifting um, objects such as groceries and luggage and whatnot, because their biceps are weak, then the bicep curl might be pretty functional for them, right? For someone who has adequate bicep strength, getting just bigger, stronger biceps probably isn't going to impact their function very much. Okay, so it, it obviously is dependent, but really, really focus on your functional objectives for that group and keep it functional. As an example, you know we have uh, uh, one or two groups that specifically do a lot of metabolic training in their. Uh, in, in their circuit. It's a very metabolic circuit. But for most of our clients, we don't do metabolic training in those circuits. Um, <clears throat> you know, as, as far as we might do some, but it's just not, not the, the primary focus of what we do because the purpose is to, to keep it functional. And so we want to focus on that. Next is match the movements to the client's abilities. I do not like to use the, the uh, kind of word modify or using modifications. You know, we don't modify exercises. We match the appropriate exercise movement, how to do it, and the right equipment, with the right stance, with the right arm pattern, with the right whatever, in order to meet the client's abilities. Okay, so it's not a modification. Just because Bob does it one way and Susan does it another way doesn't mean we've modified it for Susan, right? Susan is doing it the way Susan needs to do it for Susan. Bob is going to do it the way Bob needs to do it for Bob. So this whole idea of modifications, which really kind of develop from group exercise, in which you throw out, throw out you know, one exercise, and then you say, okay, if you can do it this way, do it this way. If you can't, then do it this way. You know, you modify it according to your abilities. Well, we're not modifying anything. Okay, we are matching the movements to their abilities, and I think that's a, a, a just a different shift, a different paradigm, a way to think about it. That's that's more than just terminology. It really is about your approach. I already mentioned this one is really group clients with similar functional abilities, um, so they're not on, on different ends of the spectrums. Make sure you're addressing a broad mix of functional domains. We all have pet exercise movements that we like and we like to do. Your clients will have things that they like to do and things that they don't like to do. Well, you know what? All that needs to be subservient to the broader goal of function. Okay, So I need to make sure that I don't keep falling into the same kind of pattern and missing out on these functional domains that I need to focus on. And then the last thing, of course, is, is, is really being safe 
at all times. The thing about working with obviously older adults in a small group environment is having to keep up with four to six clients and think about if you're working on balance exercises, the only way to improve balance is to push them to the limits of their balance ability, which means they're likely going to become unstable and they might fall. So you need to organize your groups, your circuits, so that you are going to maximize their safety and minimize the chance that they will fall. So whether that's using you know, a bar that's on the wall or using the wall or using partners or a chair to hold on to, whatever it might be, uh, make sure that you are really focused on being safe. You know, we've we've taken things for granted uh, at different times. All of us have. I've done it. Uh, we had one client that we were doing a vestibular test on, and have him. We had him stand up on two foam pads, and <clears throat> close his eyes to to assess his vestibular system. And we didn't think. You know, he was so healthy and and fit. We just assumed he didn't have a problem. And he got up there and fell over like a tree. And we had to catch him before he hit his head on the dumbbell rack. So, I mean, it was stupid that we weren't spotting appropriately, stupid that we had him next to the dumbbell rack where he, if he did fall, he was going to hurt himself. I mean, it was, you know, you can never assume. You always have to be diligent about your safety. So that was really going to help. So let's look at some of these functional circuits. Again, these can be applied in groups or they can be applied one-on-one. -on -one. And so we're going to just quickly run through four different levels of circuits, um, with level one being that lower independent or maybe that frail individual, and then up to level four, which would be a more fit individual. And just look at some of the changes that occur in the exercises themselves. So if you're working with somebody that's lower functioning, then basic strength and power is certainly going to be an issue basic mobility, basic balance. Okay, these are all things that we want to focus on. And so you'll see that as we go through the uh, the exercises, I have them grouped in, in groups of four. And you, you don't have to do this, but I really like doing this because, again, we're trying to be very efficient with our time and try to keep things moving, get a lot accomplished in a short amount of time. So what do we do? Well, <clears throat> we are going to we are going to then focus on different types of, of, uh, of exercises in order to accomplish different things. So if we look at kind of this first grouping here of, of exercises, okay, then the first grouping of exercises that we see um, <clears throat> is going to really focus on strength and power, then we're going to look at something that's pretty simple, such as balance. Then we're going to look at another strength exercise, and then another balance exercise. So the chair stands and the power stands um, are exercise. Is a, you know it's an exercise that requires a lot of strength, a little bit more intensity. We might do that for 20 seconds. We might do it for 30 seconds. Um, you know, like for our power stands, we're trying to stand up and sit down as many times as they can in 20 or 30 seconds, and that's going to get them breathing. They're going to they're going to get kind of uh, tired from that. And so w instead of just resting afterwards, we can go straight into a balance exercise in order to help them catch their breath. So we'll go to something like a tandem walk. Okay, then we might go to a standing two arm tubing chest press. Right. Um, and so because of that, we are going to vary our a lower body strength and our upper body strength. So again, our lower body is able to rest while we go to an upper body strength exercise. And then we're going to go to the one-legged stand uh, with eyes open. So again, another balance exercise. So we're able to mix it up. We're going we're to use our rest periods uh, very diligently and appropriately and purposefully so that we don't lose that um, that time and it stays very efficient. Okay. So some of the other exercises that you can see um, and you can you can use these you know with, with your clients and get out there and practice them and just kind of see how they fit together and, you, and then you'll notice of course at the end is we have a bridge and bird dog exercises which are floor exercises so some very basic core low back stability exercises um, for these lower functioning individuals. Now, of course, depending on how low functioning they are, 
some people are not going to be able to get down on the floor and back up again. So that's something you obviously have to take into consideration and maybe have to approach it from a different perspective. So now if we look at uh, our level two function, we'll see that these are kind of this is kind of a middle function um, group. And so now we're going to mix it up a little bit and we're going to start to then take away from some stability, look at some different stance positions. Um, and it, but again, we're going to focus on mixing it up between some higher intensity movements with some lower intensity movements. So that might be, you know, a strength and power exercise and then more of a, a balanced or stabilizing exercise, right? And we can kind of go back and forth with those. And so I really like that um, uh, approach because, again, it makes it very, very efficient to be able to do our training with. If we then look at then the next circuit, the level three circuit, then we see that the level three circuit is taking it up just a little bit more, it becomes more dynamic. Uh, we can even add in that plank exercise there at the, the end um, in order to focus on that core stability. And, and you see I've spread that out over kind of these three little groupings of exercises. These are things that you can kind of, you can go through one grouping and then go through them back again immediately, or you go through all the groupings and then go back and start from the top and go through them again. You can really mix it up any way you want. but Again, when I take my checklist of functional domains and I look at all these different functional domains, then I can see, okay, I can check a lot of different functional domains off by doing these exercises. <laughs> now, these might not, these uh, are just examples, obviously, so they might not fit into a full 30-minute time slot, depending on how many sets you do. You might have to expand on, on them. Uh, depending on what your purpose is, et cetera. But, you know, again, if you take something like the karaoke exercise where, you know, you're, you're moving laterally, but you step in front, you know, you cross over your legs, one in front, then you cross over behind, you go in front, go behind, keep alternating that way. And I've had, I don't know how many clients that just could not do that exercise. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're fit, they seem pretty functional, they can't do karaoke to save their life, okay? And so there's a basic motor control and coordination aspect that they have to work on. And so even as I'm working with clients, there are things that are there that are going to come up and surface as we try these if we these exercises to hit on these different domains that I might not have been able to focus on in an assessment environment. But now I see, oh wow, motor control and coordination crossing the midline. That's a big issue for this individual. And so I might try some other things in that, that same category for that person and really through the exercise, make the exercise part of my qualitative assessment of them, right? It's not like I'm writing numbers down, it's not a formal assessment, but I always qualitatively I'm, I'm assessing them and seeing what they need, okay? When we move up to then a high-functioning individual, almost the sky is the limit kind of thing, but we still want to keep following those principles of functional training and we still want to make it very high level, three dimensional training, lots of core stabilization uh, that we're working on during different dynamic movement activities, okay? And so now we reduce base of support, we can manipulate a lot of different aspects of exercises to tweak them to tweak in or to tweak out uh, different aspects of function. So if we look at some of our programming strategies, as an example, is you can look at something such as even pace or the rest periods that you use or the time intervals that you're using. You can think about how do I manipulate the complexity of an exercise if I really do want to get more motor control and coordination or agility or proprioception as an example. Um, and so a lot of different levels of manipulation that can be accomplished in order to uh, address those different functional domains in some very, very specific ways. And of course, then using partners and partner drills makes it more fun or even having the whole group, you know, do something together and collectively can be a lot of fun as well. Ultimately, I really like using 
than obstacle courses as part of my circuits as well because if people are doing obstacle courses then they can be working on a myriad of different components and adding that speed component to it then makes them you know really have to work hard work quickly uh, respond uh, to different commands and, and it makes it a lot of fun it, it feels more like a game then so <clears throat> that's just kind of uh, some different ways that we can apply you know these functional circuits and these different functional movements in either a one-on-one -on -one or a small group type of environment um, but keep in mind that when we think about small group we are still thinking about that small group personal training I don't want you to think of small group as you're standing in the middle of the room and you're barking out something you know change and people are changing a station and you really don't have a lot of interaction and involvement with them that's not the kind of small group training that's really personalized or individualized and it doesn't keep you kind of really uh, able to be engaged in all of the clients and, and what's going on. You don't want to turn your back on these clients. So keep them kind of in front of you and together so that you can always provide instruction and feedback and motivation for them and not just kind of a I'm in the middle of the room and people are going around the edge and you're kind of a, a, a drill instructor. Um, I don't that some people like that certainly um, and that can work in certain environments but I think for the mature client and this different type of client we're trying to tap into it doesn't work as well so if you are uh, interested in our functional aging special certification uh, you can get CECs from a lot of different organizations for it uh, it's about a 10-hour course about five hours of that are our video instruction and so it's, it takes anywhere from you know 15 to 20 hours probably to get ready for the online exam but but please check that out we'd love to have you well thank you so much for your time and attention uh, this will this is being recorded so you'll be able to access this later on and if you have uh, any other questions you can always contact me at my email address that's contact at functionalaginginstitute.com so contact at functionalaginginstitute.com and we will uh, get back with you so thank you very much appreciate your attendance